the new Atlantis of Lord Bacon. We have to place this type of thinking within some type of historical reference frame. We cannot estimate a work of the 17th century by the concepts of our own time. We must therefore consider it in the background of the conditions which produced it and the pressures uh, which brought it forth into objectivity. In the early years of the 17th century, an extraordinary phenomenon burst upon Europe. And that phenomenon was the Society of the Rosy Cross. This is probably one of the great mysteries of literature and perhaps one of the great mysteries of history. This society issued a series of proclamations of which the Fama and Confessio Fraternitatis are the most famous. These manifestos announced a reformation of Europe, a universal reformation, in fact, a major change in the thought and life of mankind. That such works could come into existence meant that already what we call the Reformation had accomplished a large part of its labor. Man's mind was liberated from the tremendous orthodoxy that dominated the medieval world. At the same time, a series of rather brilliant intellectuals were experimenting on the fringe of what we call today philosophic humanism. Now, I'm well aware that the modern trends in humanism may be very materialistic, but such was not the original trend in the hands of these men, most of whom were devout and sincere, God-loving human beings. Humanism to them meant the beginning of the recognition of human dignity, that the individual was important. We are told that in the so-called medieval period, the individual simply did not exist. What we understand today by humanitarianism had no real equivalent in those times. The, each individual struggling for his own survival advanced his destiny regardless of cost to other individuals. Now, the tyranny of success was probably as severe then as it begins to appear that it is to be severe in the immediate future of our own time. Everything was sacrificed to a tremendous pressure for power. When humanism began to break through this barrier, its primary interest was in the dignity of man himself. But this dignity was built upon classical foundations. The humanists derived their primary inspiration from Plato and Aristotle, and the great classical thinkers of uh, Southern Europe and North Africa. It had not occurred to these first humanists to break the ties with the past. What rather they hoped to accomplish was to bring about a restoration of the best of the past, to use man's long journey as a way of introducing him into a new way of interpreting uh, the available information and correcting the fallacies of the existing condition. There was no decided or distinct break with the past. There was rather a reinterpretation of past events. We can sense this in all of the utopian uh, writings, for they have this one common uh, theme, namely that regardless of how they sought to uh, create the concept of a better commonwealth, they always traveled to some distant place by one experience or another, being lost at sea or shipwrecked or lost in deserts or whatever the case may be, they always came in the end to a fair place 
that had existed for a long time. Somewhere in the distant parts of the world was the ideal community. It had not been discovered because its location was remote and far from the ordinary courses of human trade and traffic. This ideal city, however, stood with its battlements, its walls, its moats, or whatever seemed to be the proper uh, equipment of the time. The principal difference was that it was a well-regulated city. It was Nuremberg or Heidelberg or London or any one of the cities of the time, but reformed, enlightened. The obvious weaknesses and corruptions of society corrected, and a better and more progressive attitude uh, reigned in this mysterious and distant city. Uh, the practical foundation for many of the utopias seems to have been the, re the development of the cantonal republics of Switzerland. The Swiss had already come to a rather advanced sociological state, while much of Europe still languished in its own uh, despotisms. The Swiss cantonal system, with its tolerances, with its cooperative attitude toward life, was of great interest to all practical thinkers of the time. And there is no doubt that the Switzerland served as an archetype for a number of the utopian productions. But this was not the full story. The full story was actually that man, looking about him for the first time, free from the oppression of the existing patterns, began to examine these patterns, find fault with them, observe how they could be changed, corrected, or improved, and dared to state what he had discovered in some articulate way. He could no longer be burned at the stake for suggesting that something was wrong with his way of life. This newfound intellectual freedom produced a wave of rather progressive types of work, many of them extremely interesting. Of course, the classic of all the utopias is Moore's Utopia. And in this work, we find the beginning of a whole sequence of reflections upon existing evils. Reflections, however, that did not go sour, but rather took the challenge of the time and began to contemplate how the individual would live if he had something to say about the way he lived. Instead of being a victim of an oppressive feudalism, it was now his turn to do a little daydreaming. And these daydreams became quite interesting and articulate, and in many instances undoubtedly contributed to the rise of the Western democratic concept of living. I think we can say of Moore's Utopia that it suffered from the common ailments of these books, namely that it was rather stuffy. Uh, stuffy in the sense that if we read it today, we would not think it very progressive. We would feel that it was dogmatic, that it had about it too much of regimentation, that actually the individual uh, seeking a new freedom from one corruption fell under slavery to reform itself. So that instead of coming to liberty, he came to a classification, uh, which also is of some disturbance to people today wonder if a highly socialized system developing here would gradually destroy most of the individuality and freedom of expression of our modern way of life. Actually, of course, the authors of the utopias were not afflicting or burdening anybody. They created their characters, their cities, and their rules, and these rules never passed beyond the pages of their own books. But in spite of the restrictions and limitations of perspective that we might uh, expect and must accept, we see that these people were working primarily uh, toward a, a concept of universal education, a concept of universal suffrage, a concept of e equality, of opportunity, of equity, and of the rights of man before the law and court of his time. Each in its own way was a proclamation of a Bill of Rights. 
Each author found, as he proceeded, that his city became ever more difficult to govern. Therefore, he had to continue to do what we have done, make new laws to maintain old ones, until his utopia was as law-ridden as many of the communities he sought to reform. This experience we also have inherited from him. But in the, ba in the main, he was looking for something, and he was determined to find it. And his books had tremendous appeal. When Moore's Utopia was issued uh, with the idea that there was a mysterious island on which this wonderful city stood, uh, hundreds of people went to sea captains and tried to arrange for passage to this imaginary city. They felt that regardless of any other situation, they would rather, rather live there than any place they knew about. This led to some confusion, but gradually the pressure subsided, and men began to re realize that this utopia was an inner experience, something that man was seeking in the form of a hidden empire within his own consciousness. The next of these interesting utopian works, of course, was Campanella's City of the Sun. This was the work of a theologian, but he was well persecuted by religion for his efforts also to create the concept of a way of life which was harmonious with God and fair to mankind. Uh, Campanella recognized that ecclesiastical tyranny was no less than that of the civil courts and that it was not much different whether the individual be dominated by the clergy or by the aristocracy. This, as you can well understand, was not particularly pleasing to the church, and it uh, moved in upon Campanella and treated him pretty badly. But the principle involved was the same, that this escape uh, from domination also had to mean escape from superstition. It had to be release from spiritual authority, which in partnership with temporal authority um, afflicted the common man. So Campanella's City of the Sun was also a rather theological community, rather suggestive in many respects of a well-ordered monastery, but at the same time there was in it this desire of man to find practical ways of creating a solution to war, a solution to hate, a solution to fear. And in the beginning years of the 17th century, those problems which again loom large in our thinking were beginning to really dominate the popular mind. Probably the smuggest and most delightful of the utopias is that of the German theologian Johann Valentin André, whose book Christianopolis uh, was highly uh, uh, influenced by the culture of Switzerland. Of course, André was a devout Lutheran, and he could not for a moment support the, the uh, religious convictions of Calvinist Switzerland. But at the same time, he admitted in some of his writings that he regretted that he was unable uh, to accept wholeheartedly the Swiss way or go there and live, because in many respects he admired it greatly. But out of his entire experience, he began to develop uh, a more or less Protestant theological utopia in which, guided by the essential principles of Lutheranism, there was to be this new community dedicated to the uh, equality and uh, fundamental security of men. Uh, Luther, of course, uh, cannot be blamed for André's concepts but in his own way, Luther also, during his lifetime, expressed many of these same principles. And uh, therefore, André undoubtedly drew much inspiration from the writings of Luther himself. In this commonwealth, uh, which uh, André envisioned, there was considerable emphasis upon the economic state of man. Uh, the others were more philosophical, more abstract. But André, who was much interested in labor movements in Europe, even in his own, own time, and was one of the first to develop a cooperative to take care of and protect the widows and orphans of laboring people. Uh, 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 André was deeply 
concerned with a utopia in which everyone had the right to work, the right to have what he earned, the right to build a way of life which brought him personal security, and furthermore, if his industry was uh, sincere and intelligent, that he had a certain right to the enjoyments of leisure, of reading, of thought, and of the general improvement of his mind. Uh, Andre did not unite with the popular mind that reserved all intellectual pursuits for a small group. Uh, Andre's thinking, uh, the good city, the city of Christ, was not only a wonderful community, but it was in substance a great school. It was a place of universal enlightenment in which individuals learned by living and lived by the learning which they had uh, gradually accumulated. So it was a kind of city of proletariat philosophers, uh, philosophers that uh, were not scholastic or academic, academic, but were thoughtful persons to whom security brought the right to be thoughtful, the privilege to think and the mind could be relieved from the very great emergencies of daily existence. This type of thinking also uh, permeated other utopian productions of that period. Now this brings us to the subject of the New Atlantis, which was produced by an entirely different type of person. This uh, work, in fact all of the others included, seem to have risen from this idea of a universal reformation of mankind. This reformation was the very uh, pro uh, pronouncement of all the utopias, that a new kind of life was opening for man. This new life was related somewhat also to the Western Hemisphere, to the, ev to the development of a great new country where plantations could be established, where men could escape from the perils and miseries of the old world and build in the new world a way of life closer to their heart's desire. It is very probable that uh, the Rosicrucian manifestos and the utopias were both to a degree keyed to the development of the Western Hemisphere. For here at last seemed to be an opportunity to break away uh, from the traditions of the old world and go forth in search of freedom of conscience, freedom of worship, freedom of opportunity by which the individual could escape from the decadence of early 17th century Europe. The most interesting of these works to us is Lord Bacon's because of the tremendous implications that are involved in the book and which surround it. We can therefore really regret that it remained a fragment, that as far as his lordship was concerned, the work was never finished. We might note, however, that in 1660, what was considered to be or advanced as the continuation of the New Atlantis was published. It was published under initials only, and the author of the second section, or second part, has never with certainty been identified. Studying it, however, there seems to be some question as to whether the second part shall be considered a legitimate extension of the original, or whether it was a fabrication of later date by some ambitious person who sought to expand the earlier account. There are two schools of thinking on this, and both sides have considerable armament, but the matter has never been actually settled. We also realize uh, from our own thinking and studying that Lord Bacon was almost certainly deeply and closely involved in the rise of the Rosicrucian uh, society in England. We also have reason to suspect that the society was actually founded in England, although uh, the manifestos would attempt to move it to Germany. In addition, we remember the statements made uh, by Burton in his Anatomy of Melancholy, a very famous nostalgic book of the period, uh, where 
uh, Burton distinctly identifies Bacon with André, the German theologian who did the Christianopolis. As a footnote to a quotation, Burton writes, Johann Valentin André, comma, Lord Verulam. Well, of course, André was never Lord Verulam, and uh, the relationship to Bacon is inevitable. There is also much proof and many uh, documents to sustain the fact that Bacon and André and Campanella were in communication with each other. And it is quite possible that a good many of these utopian productions arose in a common factory of the minds, uh, inspired by a definite purpose. And that purpose was to support and advance the Universal Reformation as expounded in the Fama and Confessio Fraternitatis. In any event, the New Atlantis has been tied in many ways to the Rosicrucian problem. John Hayden, who wrote about 1660 and claimed to have a considerable knowledge of the Rosicrucians, published the New Atlantis as a Rosicrucian fable, changing only a few words and introducing the word Rosy Cross in two or three places where it is not in Bacon's original text. Now, this has caused a considerable amount of controversy also. In 1660, we must assume that the Lord Bacon's works were rather well known in England. In fact, we know that most of them have passed through several editions, and that uh, the Royal Society, which was based upon Bacon's original concepts, was beginning to take shape and influence English thinking. Therefore, we cannot assume that the English people were unaware of the New Atlantis. And it is more or less foolish to also assume that Hayden could have hoped that his plagiarization would pass undetected. There seems to be more reason to suppose that either Hayden himself believed that the New Atlantis was a Rosicrucian fable and therefore felt justified in making these changes, or else he was party to some knowledge and actually knew that Lord Bacon's fable was intended to be a Rosicrucian work. These questions are probably over the period of centuries we won't answer, but at least they're worth thinking about as we proceed. So we come now to the New Atlantis itself, and I think we have an interesting project on our hands. Here is the first edition of the New Atlantis, published in 1627 as the appendix to Lord Bacon's Silva Silvarum, or the Natural History of Winds in Ten Centuries. This is part of his great work, the Instauratio Magna, or the Textbook of Universal Knowledge. And uh, the New Atlantis is appended to this as a fragment. This is its first appearance in print. It is described on the title page, The New Atlantis, a work unfinished, written by the Right Honorable Francis Lord Verulam, Viscount St. Albans. In the uh, lower part of the title page, there is a rather interesting vignette. This vignette shows the figure of time, now presented almost in the form of Pan, but as an aged man, with the lower members resembling those of a goat, uh, carrying also the scythe, accompanied by the hourglass, and drawing a female figure from a cavern, which is to be found at the viewer's left of the picture. Uh, the uh, Latin motto which surrounds this central device reads that in time all that is hidden shall be made known. This is a rather interesting cryptic title page and uh, is found only on very few books. This particular woodblock, uh, there's an interesting thing that uh, perhaps would interest you in connection with it. This particular woodblock does occur on some other books. I have traced it on an English cookbook, uh, which uh, is quite intriguing. This cookbook was published about the same time as this book, and theoretically the printers had these devices available. The cookbook in question came out in two editions in the same year, 
One edition carried this in this little vignette, the other did not. Uh, they were both published the same year, uh, about in the middle 1630s or thereabout. Uh, a copy of the book without the vignette can be bought in the book trade for about $25. The only copy I have seen listed of the edition with the vignette of the same year was priced at 700 pounds. The text is the same. No one seems to know why. The answer seems to be, at least, that all through this literature of this period, we have what might be termed landmarks, uh, peculiar markings to identify or signify things of importance. I suspect strongly that if we went through the two editions of the aforementioned cookbook, we would find that they are not printed from the same type although they were printed in the same year. I think we would also find that the co copy that contains the vignette is ciphered, that is, has a code running through it. The other copy does not. A number of persons are probably are aware of this, and one by one the available copies of that particular edition have disappeared from public uh, availability. Of course, there's always a chance one would show up somewhere. But uh, the demand for that edition is far greater than the demand for the uncoded edition. Therefore, uh, having seen this type of thing happen again and again, we begin to wonder if there is not some uh, meaning that we should look for where this coding appears or where this monument is raised upon the title of a book. In this case, I think we are entitled to look for something, and I do think that we don't have to look very far to find it. Uh, one interesting point, I think, occurs in the preface to the reader that is signed by Dr. Raleigh, who was Lord Bacon's chaplain and secretary. And he gives us just a little clue uh, to the New Atlantis. Remember now that apparently the New Atlantis is a fictional work also, dealing with one of these mysterious utopias. This one apparently located somewhere mid-Pacific, halfway between the coast, the western coast of America and the coast of Asia. But in any event, uh, uh, Raleigh writes, This fable my lord devised, to the end that he might exhibit therein a model or description of a college instituted for the interpreting of nature and the producing of great and marvelous works for the benefits of man. Under the name of Solomon's House or the College of the Six Days Work, and even so far his lordship hath proceeded as to finish that part. Certainly the model is more vast and high than can possibly be imitated in all things. Notwithstanding, most things therein are within man's power to effect. His lordship thought also in this present fable to have composed a frame of laws, or of the best state, or mold of a commonwealth. But foreseeing it would be a long work, his desire to the collecting of the natural history diverted him, and he preferred many degrees before it. The, um, this opens a very interesting point because we know that it was upon the model of this New Atlantis College that the Royal Society of England was later founded. And Spratt in his history of the Royal Society definitely declares that the inspiration of it was derived from Bacon's College of the Six Days Work. We also know that Newton... Uh, and uh, many other important men of his time, scientists and uh, architects, leaders of thought, belong to a group called the Society of the Unknown Philosophers. This has likewise been traced, and we find that it arose among the same group that later integrated the Royal Society. Thus, out of the uh, College of the Six Days' Work, an actual physical institution did ultimately spring.
But this institution was only a fragment of the original invention. It was evident from this uh, preface of Raleigh's that Bacon had in mind creating the archetype or pattern of a great system of education, and that therefore it was not to be regarded merely as a fable, nor even as a utopia in the popular sense of that time. It was not just a story of men seeking for a better world. It had to do with something uh, which in the development of the account uh, we are impelled to assume already had an existence. And that like several of these other utopias, these distant places hidden from men implied perhaps a secret society or a secret association of persons that actually did exist, as in the case of the guilds, where the concept of a social commonwealth existed long before it burst through to become a political equation in European history. In any event, this is the, uh, the idea of a great college or school that was to be built. The next point, I think, is perhaps more dramatic than any of the others because it reveals an extraordinary knowledge which Lord Bacon possessed. He causes his mariners to start out from the coast of Peru, which is a peculiar place for them to start from. They sailed from Peru in a westerly direction, and after a time met adverse winds and were unable to proceed on their journey. Uh, they then were favored by winds from the south that drove them northward. And where, or in what locality, we are assumed to suppose that uh, the discovery of this mysterious island of the wise men uh, took place, we have no way of actually estimating. Various opinions have been advanced on this also. Perhaps this supposed area was somewhat near to what we now know as the Hawaiian Islands. Perhaps what was really implied was some of the primitive cultures of the South Pacific. In any event, several points are of interest, particularly to Americanists who have been working in this area. The principal thinking is based also upon certain words used by Lord Bacon which in his time were meaningless or entirely beyond the general uh, comprehension of the day. Some of the points that he makes in here were not finally clarified until the present century. Yet he seems to have had some basic knowledge about these older uh, places. For example, in part one place in the New Atlantis, uh, we have this sentence. Yet so much is true that the said country of Atlantis, as well as that of Peru, then called Coya, as that of Mexico, then named Tarambo, were mighty or proud kingdoms in arms, shipping, and riches. Now this is uh, more than just a guess. In some way, uh, Bacon was in possession of certain facts. The Kolua, which is the, the present pronunciation of the word which Bacon calls Koya, was the name for an ancient uh, level of classical and cultural attainment of almost prehistoric Peru. This was not known in England or anywhere else at the time of Bacon. But it is quite possible uh, that this particular group of Koya, symbolizing a prehistoric Peruvian culture, uh, fits into some of our modern archaeological needs in our own present-day effort to trace uh, the antiquity of Peruvian culture. For here was one of the very great centers of ancient Western uh, culture. Uh, Point Dexter, in his study of the Inca, has also noted that in uh, the description of one of the great personages of Solomon's house, 
it is described by Bacon that he carry uh, that he wore a turban like hat or cap in which was placed a stalk of wheat this stalk of wheat occurs in ancient Indian pictures of the Incas and the great leaders of the Peruvian culture used the stalk of wheat as a scepter now we don't know how Bacon might have known this it is possible that some of these records were brought back but he seems to be working from something more than just uh, a fabled interest in a situation there is some possibility though we have never been able to pin down the facts with certainty that Bacon was with Drake on one of his voyages to the Western world it is also possible uh, that Bacon because of his extraordinary connections was able to do something that no other European before him had attempted to do and no one since his time had thought of doing namely that Bacon was aware that a great system of culture including mystery schools and initiation into secret orders did exist in the Western Hemisphere prior to the advent of the colonization scheme and also that these cultures had reached a very high degree of attainment in Peru and in Mexico is he telling us then in the story of his new Atlantis that he has actually learned that this mysterious college of the six days work actually existed in the Western Hemisphere prior to the advent of the Spaniards was this wonderful city of Mexico for example which Cortes described as the most beautiful city in all the world the Venice of the Western Hemisphere was this city actually also a great cultural center did it possess some institution which could have inspired the idea of Solomon's house and also inspired the general concept of Bacon's mysterious island of the blessed which he called Ben Salem or in the larger sense the son of peace this particular possibility that Bacon was aware that an ancient cultural foundation existed here uh, may have an interesting bearing on our general thinking the new Atlantis also makes another point concerning the old Atlantis which is important it states in here that the old Atlantis was not destroyed by earthquakes as some of the Greek writers had presumed but that it was destroyed by water and that this water did not completely inundate the land but it did rise to a considerable height for a time possibly due to great tidal waves or some other uh, catastrophe and that this water rising to a height of 30 or 40 feet destroyed those living in lower areas who were unable to escape its devastating uh, action but some did escape and did hide themselves uh, in higher ground and therefore did survive the catastrophe Bacon takes the attitude uh, that this also occurred while the Atlanteans had sent a great fleet against the Athenian states and that this fleet probably either destroyed during the journey or ultimately unable to return uh, made no effort to uh, restore the ancient land but were either exterminated elsewhere or absorbed into the cultures of other people but at about the same time to ramble the then ancient city of Mexico also then led an expedition against the island of Ben Salem and threatened to exterminate the wonderful city where stood the college of the six days work this expedition also failed not because the people of Ben Salem destroyed the invaders but because the invaders returning to their own land after having taken an oath not to further disturb the peace of this fabled city 
were later destroyed by the wrath of God in the form of floods and other natural disasters. This concept does agree, in some part at least, with the records that we have here in the Western Hemisphere of the destruction of the continent of the islands of mud. For in the uh, Aztec and Maya chronicles of the destruction of the ancient land, the uh, same idea as Bacon himself gives us is developed, namely that these mudlands sank or were brought so low that they could no longer sustain habitation, that, the, uh, that these low areas were turned into great bogs of mud, and that uh, in this disaster uh, numerous persons perished, but that others were saved and did escape to other areas where they built a new world. Bacon seems to imply that what we call the American Indians are survivors of this deluge. And that is the reason why the country was so sparsely populated, because these peoples were only remnants of an older people that had perished a long time ago. And uh, Bacon also suggests something that the modern anthropologist is very suspicious of, namely that the, uh, the so-called North American Indian culture on this hemisphere was probably not much more than a thousand years older than the advent of the Spaniards and other colonists. All this fits together, you can make something of it or not as you please, but it fits together to show that the author was working with a much more serious intent than might generally be supposed. It is in this work also that Bacon muses the significant line, the new Atlantis, which is America. And therefore, he uses the whole concept in his writing to suggest that the American continent received the survivors of the ancient Atlantean deluge, that part of this continent itself was involved in that destruction, and that uh, gradually uh, a process of the extending and expanding of a new culture here was underway when the colonists arrived. And uh, we have a number of works uh, that seem to sustain this thinking, because uh, at least one Americanist has taken the attitude that if the colonists had been another hundred years getting here, they could never have taken the continent. There was a tremendous uh, rising of culture in all three divisions of America, North, Central, and South. And this culture, had it grown somewhat stronger, it would have reached empire and dominion in its own right. Therefore, perhaps it was a rising culture, uh, restoring itself from an older and previous destruction. It has always been among esotericists uh, a habit to refer to the American Indian as an Atlantean, and this would actually uh, support Bacon's position, although our thinking was unknown in his day. With all this, however, I think we have to be very careful that we do not uh, become too much involved uh, in the uh, geographical, geological implications of the story unless we want to stay there for a while and work with it, because certainly there is possibility in this direction. But there is also possibility that Bacon used his Atlantis fable almost precisely as Plato had before him. Plato, of course, in his preparation of the Atlantis account, also ends in the middle of a sentence. His concept of the Atlantis is also a work unfinished, just as Lord Bacon's was. And there may be intent or reason for this. It may be in truth that uh, the stories both deal with an unfinished product that only time can finish as only time can place the capstone on the mysterious pyramid on the United States seal. In any event, there are several possibilities in the Atlantic fable. The one thing that we know is that psychologically the past or that which has gone before in the life of an individual or in the collective folk consciousness of a people is gradually submerged by present events. Therefore, psychologically, 
of the vast tradition of a people retires from a conscious objectivity to a subconscious subjectivity. Little by little, we build over the surface of the past until this past seems to retire into an obscurity and darkness. Yet periodically and under certain pressureful circumstances, this past bursts through out of its own subjective darkness and has a distinct and definite bearing upon our present way of life. Some have held that Plato, under the fable of the lost Atlantis, uh, described the fall of man, or the fall or destruction of the golden age which preceded the present experience of mankind. Uh, he could only mean by this uh, the fall of man from a state of spiritual luminance into a state of material obscuration. That perhaps this fall of man is therefore the descent of the human being into the material world and the creation of a physical material dilemma in which his ancient a spiritually awakened state is no longer remembered by him. As the child coming into birth loses all many, any and all memory of a pre-existence, so man, gradually descending into materiality, loses likewise all record of any previous conscious experience. This in turn leads gradually to the fall of human consciousness into the darkness of material uh, embodiment. That the lost Atlantis, therefore, is the, uh, the lost golden age, the lost better world that preceded the state we know. This brings us to a very interesting problem that has never also been well settled. And that is why history from the beginning, from all the history that we know, is always the history of the decline of peoples. Everything we pick up, every history that we read, is the history of something falling apart over great periods of time. Uh, when did Egypt rise? What history do we have of the magnificent ascendancy of Egypt? The first time Egypt comes to us, we find it already strewn with monuments to the heroic dead. Little by little, as, as Egypt's history unfolds, Egypt falls apart until finally it disappears as a powerful nation. What do we know of the history of the rise of China? What do we know of the great classical Chinese civilization that must have long preceded Confucius and Lao Tzu? Nothing. We only pick up China misgoverned and badly managed, exploited and corrupted, and gradually falling apart under a succession of selfish or inadequate rulers. One dynasty after another, and in their arts the same. Where is the great art of China? The great art of China is prehistoric. The great art of China belongs to the dynasty of the Shan, and we have very little of it. This was the great classic period of somewhere between four or five hundred and twelve or fourteen hundred B.C. Then we come down a little later, and we have pretty good art in the Han Dynasty. Then we get some fairly good things, but not quite so good, in the Dynasty of the Wei. These dynasties early in the Christian centuries. Then comes a fine diffusion of art, but not quite so good, in the Tang Dynasty. The Tang Dynasty moves inevitably into the Sung, and things are getting worse artistically every minute. Finally, it collapses into the Ming Dynasty when art falls apart. So that today, art of a hundred years ago in China is for the most part totally uninspired. And art of three thousand years ago is the highest in China. Why? Why do these things always fall apart? If we go to Greece, we have no knowledge of, of the true culture of Greece except a few fragments. These fragments we know so little about that it was perfectly possible to fabricate a whole group of Etruscan antiquities and deceive the best curators in the museums of the world. That these ancient fabrications 
based upon fragments, were far better than anything produced in the classical period. Babylonian culture went to sleep almost before history began, as far as we are concerned. And we know that when the Spaniards reached the coast of uh, Central America, the Indians living there had already forgotten the builders of the great monument cities that dot that area. All these things belong to some other time, time that was sometime good, but little by little fell apart. What is the history of Europe? but the history of a great continent falling apart, ethically, culturally, morally, and spiritually. Until today, we are truly at a very low ebb in all European consideration. If we want to look for anything that is interesting or important in Europe, we must go back to the Druids, to Stonehenge, to the monuments of Karnak in Brittany. We have to go back to the ancient Nordic mysteries, the Scythian invasions, the Phoenician merchants, there was where Europe was. It is true that culturally Europe was greater 500 years ago in some respects than it is today, but it was not too much even then. The great history of Europe is unknown. Back in the very dawn of things, there must have been and was great universities like Bibractus, where the Druid colleges were and where men were measuring accurately the motions of the stars while most of what we call Europe was still in a hopelessly primitive state. Where were the beginnings of these things? Where were the great rises of empires? Where were the magnificent foundations of culture? Who taught the Egyptians their great philosophies? We don't know. Where did Orpheus come from? We don't know. Where did the great rites of Babylonia come from? We can only guess. What came before India? What before Persia? No one knows. Yet practically every institution that we know is born full, fully developed and matured, like Athena from the head of Zeus. These things do not quite fit together and make sense, but we are faced with them. And the... Uh, psychological possibility seems to be that there was, at the beginning of things, some kind of a tremendous dynamic. That this dynamic gradually, over a vast period of time, sank and is now utterly immersed under the surface of the dissonant, dissonant cultural fragments that we today call civilization. There are even traces of a world language now forgotten. There are evidences of world art. There is a great deal of proof of world navigation thousands of years ago. What was it all about? How did it happen? When did it happen? And why was all of this slowly and inevitably broken down? Until while we have a certain scientific achievement today, we have built our modern civilization not upon a magnificent monument, but upon a classic ruin. This, uh, this is perhaps in some way related to the psychology of Atlantis. The psychology that somewhere there was the positive side of this thing we call culture. Whether we wish to assume that Atlantis was a place, or that we wish to assume that Atlantis was a state of consciousness, perhaps the thing we are seeking for, this rise of life, was never a physical thing at all. Perhaps this rise of life took place within man himself. Perhaps civilization rose in man and fell in the world which man fashioned. Perhaps the human being himself was the great reservoir of culture. It may well be, therefore, that this mysterious older time was a time in which man's consciousness was more free from the obsessions which now afflict it, and that man, growing, unfolding in the light of truth, achieved a great level of reason, and then reason prompting him to a series of material uh, achievements. Gradually, this reason was buried or drowned in the objective civilization which man attempted to build. <coughs> 
man shifted from the idea of evolution as unfoldment to the idea of evolution as amassment. And in this, his whole pattern of existence began to fall apart. So it's possible that this rise of empires was hidden inside or within the conscious unfoldment of collective humanity, even as the fall of empires is manifested outwardly in the institutions which man has fashioned. Certainly at some time we got off on the wrong foot and we've never been able to get back. But prior to that, perhaps we were on the right foot. And perhaps in this case, our great problem was that we were building great persons, unfolding great principles within ourselves by natural means. And somewhere along the line, this unfolding intelligence took the bit in its teeth and turned upon its own source, attempting to apply itself to the conquest of other things rather than to the continual unfoldment of its own nature. Such a psychological situation, did it arise in a person, would result in the same composite confusion that we seem to find traced in the civilization of our world. In any event, it's something that perhaps uh, we will find of interest if we consider it. We know that Lord Bacon was primarily an educator. We know that he attempted a complete restoration of the learning of the world. And we also know that in his entire concept he was moved by highly humanitarian motives. Bacon was undoubtedly of the opinion from his writing that we already possessed all that was necessary uh, to establish an enduring culture. That what we had to do, therefore, was to take what we knew and use it. It did not occur to him that we are in the presence of a great emergency in which the knowledge that we possess would be inadequate. I think also in the Instro Ratio Magna, particularly in that part which is called the Scala Intellectus, or the Ladder of the Mind, Bacon points out that there is no need for an emergency, that emergency thinking arises from breaking the proper sequence of mental development. In other words, there is no real reason why a world should ever be in crisis. The reason why it is in a critical state is because groups of persons or whole generations of persons neglect those forms of knowledge which prevent crisis, and therefore suddenly awaken in a critical situation, largely due to the neglect of common facts. Incidentally, uh, these travelers in a distant watery expanse finally reached the island of Ben Salem, and here they found a fair city well governed. And here they were welcomed by a Christian people who had been converted centuries before uh, by a wonderful miracle wrought through St. Bartholomew, by which the scriptures had reached them in a mysterious ark-like fox floating on the sea and guarded by a pillar of light. In any event, when these mariners reached this far distant and apparently inaccessible place, they found themselves in the presence of a cultured people, receiving them kindly and with all humanity, and willingly sharing with them uh, much of their knowledge and their understanding. Now in the midst of this fair city was this mysterious House of Solomon, and it was here that stood in glory, the college of the six days' work. Now the masters of this college, those who were the governors and leaders and instructors in the house of the six days' work, were rarely seen even by the inhabitants of Ben Salem. They lived strangely alone and apart in their great university city.
there seems to be no clear insight as to where the student body came from, incidentally, which might cause us also to wonder about the story a little and to suspect that we are dealing with double talk. But these mariners, as a good story must always have it, were pleasantly fortunate in being allowed to meet one of the mysterious elders of Solomon's house. And from him they received a certain uh, information or knowledge. And the lines involved in this are so well known and so famous that I think it would pay perhaps to re revive them by reading uh, the salutation of this master of Solomon's house to this seafaring wanderer who came to this strange shore and was permitted to meet this august and most wonderful person. And this wise man, seated enthroned, surrounded by his attendants, thus addressed the, the uh, sailor who had uh, come in search of security to the land of Ben Salem. He, the elder says, God bless thee, my son. I will give thee, thee the greatest jewel I have, for I will impart unto thee, for the love of God and men, a relation of the true state of Solomon's house. Son, to make you know the true state of Solomon's house, I will keep this order. First, I will set forth unto you the end of our foundations. Secondly, the preparations and instruments we have for our works. Thirdly, the several employments and functions uh, whereto our fellows are assigned. And fourthly, the ordinances and rites which we observe. Then there is a break, an open space, and this four-line paragraph set aside, apart from the rest of the text. The end of our foundation is the knowledge of causes, the secret motions of things, and the enlarging of the bounds of human empire to the effecting of all things possible. This is, in substance, the code or credo of the college of the six days' work, that the end of all of our foundation is the knowledge of causes. Now this is really one of Lord Bacon's most profound scientific statements, and this in itself entitles this work, as Dr. Raleigh points out, to be included in a scientific text. In the school of the six days' work, the first and most, con most important consideration is that men shall know the causes of things and the secret motions of things. This knowledge of causes brings us head on into the great problem of modern education. For Lord Bacon has frequently observed in his writings that primary things must first be considered before secondary matters may be safely indulged. And the primary uh, cause of all things must answer the primordial question, why? Why is the essential question, and it can be applied in various ways to practically all of the concerns of life. One of the primary questions for man must always be, why am I here? The questions about the nature of existence. Why is existence? The nature of the problem of first cause. The eternal why at the root of life. Now in our tremendous concern with modern knowledge, as one scientist wrote not too long ago in one of his books, we have come head on into the impossibility of the question why. We do not know why we are here. We do not know why anything is. We can answer the question is why uh, the question why is there a cat? We don't know. Why are there trees? 
Why are there rocks? Why are there planets? We do not know any of the primary questions of existence. The knowledge of causes, therefore, must be the knowledge of the primary reason for things. The primary reason for our own living. The primary reason for the fact that we can think, that we can feel, that we can have sensory perceptions. Why can I see? Why can I hear? Now these questions, unfortunately and tragically enough, are the questions most commonly asked by a seven-year-old, sometimes a six-year-old if they are precocious. But by the time they are twelve years old, these children are taught not to ask these questions, because nobody has any good answers. And it is much easier to say the question is uh, irrelevant, immaterial, and inconsequential than it is to answer the question. Now, the, uh, the whole theory of Bacon's uh, ladder of the intellect, uh, based largely upon Plotinus, is that the foundation of all security must arise from the knowledge of causes. Until we have solved the matter of causation, until we know the why behind things, we have no idea of what to do. We do not know what nature wants. We do not know what God wills. Bacon points this out quite strongly. We simply are unable to obey because we do not know what we are obeying. We have certain concepts about things. And we have developed a series of theological postulations to largely fill the interval of why. Then we have taken this why and arbitrarily, in our own thinking, redefined its meaning. So that science says today, whenever we ask why, we mean how. We do not ask why a thing is but how it operates. If you want a definition of electricity, you will not find out what it is. You will find out how it operates. And you will also find that most things are named from their functions and not from their substances. Because as yet we are unaware of substances. Yet man is able out of the inner life of himself to ask the question, why? And because he has the capacity to formulate the question as the expression of his own uncertainty, it is inevitable that man also has the potential to find the answer. This is why Lord Bacon broke with the Aristotelian system of study. He believed decidedly and definitely that we could no longer build a way of life upon a series of arbitrary formulas, regardless of how enlightened, noble, and really beautiful these formulas may be. We cannot answer a question with a definition. We cannot answer why by going into a long and rambling discourse on what other people have thought about why. To Bacon, therefore, the problem of the great university had to do with the correction of the direction of our effort, that instead of first attempting to swallow the entire world of knowledge at a single gulp, the problem that confronts us is to discover the nature of causes, to head into this rather than away from it. Instead of regarding the problem of causation as a taboo area or a place where only madmen and mystics dare reside, we have to begin to think of the directing of the faculties of man 
to the discovery of why, or of the nature of causes. Now it is obvious, as Lord Bacon also points out, that we have certain instruments whereby it is conceivable that we might be able to find the answers to why. These instruments include tradition, which is the best that we have learned from the past, observation, which is the living and immediate contemplation of the fact, and experimentation, which is the effort to reproduce universal processes under the disciplined controlled methods of laboratory technique. But altogether, the direction of this effort must be not from the self out into the world of phenomena, so that that individual who memorizes the most definitions is the most learned. Our problem is to look into the cause. And it is obvious that we have only one possible instrument for the investigation of causes, and that is ourselves. In some way, we must turn the direction of our inquiry. We must turn it from the accumulation of external facts and the extension of external usages to the discovery of the essential fact namely what the nature of cause itself requires or demands of any process. For what we are doing now is following lines of effect, but we have not demonstrated the validity of cause. We have not found the basic reason for life, the basic reason for our own existence nor have we found the underlying truth principles upon which science, philosophy, and religion should be built. So the College of the Six Days' Work is based, of course, upon the idea of the six creative days in which God fashioned all things. And this is brought down to a microcosm or to the power of man himself. And in the beginning, God said, let there be light. And this is the beginning of our problem. And also in the very early part, God divided the heavens from the earth. The heavens being the abodes of causes, the earth being the area of effects. And he placed certain powers in the heavens and certain powers in the earth. And man has advanced continuously regarding the lower hemisphere. He has explored the earth and continues to explore it. And under the heading of earth we mean not only the planet but the entire material diffusion of galaxies in which we exist. But heaven as the nature of causes, the internal the root of ourselves remains unexplored. So Bacon would have us revise our entire thinking and seek first this root. And having discovered this, we are then in a condition and a position to advance all other forms of knowledge. For becoming aware of the universal purpose, we then have enlightened reason and incentive to advance that purpose. Whereas now, each person, considering differently the meaning of this basic purpose, each proceeds in his own way, in conflict with others, and there is no common agreement even as to the simplest of the spiritual values of life. But this is the beginning of his foundation, and it is also the purpose toward which all knowledge must lead. For as surely as this is the beginning, so, as he says, it is the end. For the end of all knowledge is not the increase of empire, but finally is the full knowledge of the causes of those things which we have previously examined. 
so that in any direction that we turn, cause becomes the great consideration. We must discover the nature of the basic principle in which we exist, and which exists in and through us. For until we have discovered this basic principle, we cannot advance any other form of knowledge adequately. Now from this point on, Lord Bacon then goes into a detailed description of the scientific achievements of the island of Ben Salem. And for his time, I think his findings are most extraordinary. For he declares that in this great college uh, we have to face an entire system of life based upon continual research into the natures of things uh, to discover their reasons and their purposes, and also how these reasons and these purposes can be directed to the security and improvement of man so that in the end man shall attain all good things that are possible to man. And Lord Bacon goes into a very detailed description of situations that are quite uh, within our present thinking, but certainly did not belong to his day, especially when we consider that he is applying them to the Western Hemisphere. He tells us, for example, that there are in this great house of the seven days work, uh, the house of Solomon, the wise king, uh, schools or divisions set up for the study of all special and difficult subjects, that there are tunnels that have been dug into the earth so that man can understand the nature of things beneath him and behind him and below him in all of the walks of nature and of life. And there are towers raised to the sky for the contemplation of the stars and the measuring of winds and currents in the air. There are all kinds of laboratories for experimenting with medicines, with dyes, with all kinds of contrivances and machines. There are houses of inventions where the most skillful of men labor to perfect all manner of device by which the common good shall be advanced. All these things are parts of the natural and proper labor of Solomon's house. And in the mysterious appendix work, which I mentioned as being published about 1660, there is long ahead of any development that we know of bearing upon it, a, a, a discovery or description of a method of uh, transmitting messages by uh, telegraphy. Uh, how it is possible through sending impulses through the air which can be read at a distance. Messages can be communicated because these impulses are of different lengths. So we have all kinds of strange knowledge implied in these things. And it was the advancement of this phase of the problem that undoubtedly inspired the foundation of the Royal Society. But we cannot stop here, because Lord Bacon then proceeds to explain how this country, though isolated, so that other men cannot find it, and this great school, hidden by nature in the most distant parts of the sea, Although others are not aware of, it, of its existence, this school has sent, under various pseudonyms, or in secret, or incognito, its scholars and its students to every part of the world. And there are twelve who travel everywhere about the earth, gathering all the knowledge of men and bringing it back. And there are also others who perfecting knowledge within the mysteries and confines of Solomon's house do in secret go back and diffuse that knowledge in other lands without revealing where it comes from. So that this house of wisdom is a kind of secret house raised in the world uh, to which persons uh, can go under certain conditions, but only under certain conditions.
Now, in most of the utopias, these conditions are approximately the same. The individual must be shipwrecked, or he must be totally lost, or he must be on the verge of terrible disaster, when there is no longer any hope of his being saved, as in the case of these sailing people, who, having no longer any provision, were on the verge of death when they found this safe harbor. I think the implication of this is rather obvious, that Solomon's house, or the mystery of true knowledge, is not to be found except in extremity, in some terrible emergency in which the human being, despairing of survival, is in this very despair brought into contact with the elements of his own preservation. The general theme behind all the utopias is that men will not turn to this kind of essential knowledge until they despair of survival by any other means. That by nature the individual is self-centered and self-purposed. That he will continue in his present courses as long as he can endure them. And it is only when he recognizes the immediacy of an ultimate disaster that he prays earnestly and genuinely for salvation. And having thus addressed heaven, having in this way sincerely opened his heart, having asked as the ancient American Indian did, that the elders of the true ones will show him the way, becoming thus humble in his own spirit, then he discovers rising before him the blessed city of the Utopias. This again suggests the journey of man in his quest of essential knowledge, that it is only uh, in some terrible crisis that the individual will come face to face with his own inadequacy. And the apparent indication in all of it is that this utopia, this house of Solomon, is in some way always accessible to man. It is never more distant from him than himself but it is not to be easily found, uh, that agents and messengers from it are constantly going forth, and also that all the news of the world is brought to them, but they themselves are concealed. In a certain sense, all the news of the world is brought to each one of us by our own sensory perceptions and from the sensory perceptions pass inward to something within ourselves which is likewise concealed, and the nature of which we do not fully understand. If it is true that the human body is the living temple, it is also quite possible that man himself is this living college of the six days' work. That while this man is forever receiving insight, sending forth his messengers in search of knowledge everywhere, that these messengers travel, so to say, in secret, and are not generally known uh, by the nations to which they come. But they bring back all knowledge. But the school itself, which is to use this knowledge, which is to gradually bring it together into this great mystery of causation, to solve the mystery of causes, this school is unseen, connected to the world perhaps only by this bridge of sensory perception. Consequently, we have the feeling, perhaps, that in prayer, in destitution, in great emergency, under tremendous difficulty, men suddenly ceasing to be worldly wise, turning from this peculiar course that has always led civilization to destruction, becoming humble, becoming receptive to light from within, are then enabled uh, to make use of this great wisdom that lies within us. Actually, inside of man, the seven days of creation exist. Within each one of us are the rounds and racial cycles which have preceded us. Man is the product himself of the seven 
great creative cycles. And within his own nature he has a record of all that has gone before. Within himself is the living history of his world. Within his own subconscious is the living experience of his own eternity. Somewhere submerged in him is the lost world of the past. We try desperately to restore civilization from rocks and ruins. Actually, this civilization is a subconscious part of our own natures. We were Babylonia. We were Egypt. We were the glories of Greece and Rome. We were all that has preceded us in history. But between us and our ability to grasp this implication lies this difficult wall of our own materialism. While man is convinced that he had no existence prior to his present life and will have no existence subsequent to it, he is locked within a small cycle of immediate events. This in itself will destroy his relationship to the past and future. It makes it impossible for him to justify the one thing that is necessary, and that is the exploration of his own psychic potential. If man can dig far enough and deeply enough into himself, he will stand face to face with the total living universe. He will stand in the presence of all of the dynamic factors that make up existence. He will be again reliving all knowledge that he needs to know in order to possess the answer to the eternal why. Otherwise, as Bacon points out, he must be content with fair picture galleries. He must be content merely to look upon the shadows of things, drawings and sculpturings. He must see fair statues of ancient persons honored for their various achievements. He must look upon all things from a strange historical perspective. But these picture galleries, whether they be carved in archaeological rock or what they may be, are not the living facts. They are the bones of things dead. They died because of the circumstances within themselves which caused death. But they also lived at one time because of the vital realities in them which promoted life. In order to solve the mystery of life, we must work with life and not with death. In order to solve the substance of things, we cannot become wholly and totally absorbed in shadows. It is interesting to restore the hanging gardens of Babylonia but we can restore them and die today. The problem is, what was the living force behind Babylonia? What did we learn there? In what way did Babylonia become a part, a step, in the unfoldment of a great stream of life moving forever in space? This is the secret motion of things referred to by Bacon. For well, this secret motion is the motion of life itself, the motion of things from their causes through their events to their ends. The secret motion of things in man is the motion of his own life principle. From an eternity of remote past to an eternity of incredible future, man himself is the guardian and custodian of the living motion of things. And this great school of the six days' work is the school which man has within himself because he has graduated therefrom. We could not be here if we had not graduated from the past. Maybe we graduated without honors, and it sometimes looks as though we barely made it. But in the same time, we have been there, we have done it. We have come through in some way. Perhaps the papers were never marked in our cases. But we did come through. We have lived through the school of the six days' work. The only way in which we can restore this 
is to assume, which we have a right to assume, that we do not live for no reason. We do not live simply because of, a, of an accidental or fortuitous condition of existence. We have experienced what we have experienced because we needed it. And yet, in some mysterious way, everything that we have learned has been blocked out. Now, the reason why it was blocked out seems to be that it was because we would be unable uh, to carry the full weight of this previous knowledge and at the same time have integration to go forward. It is perhaps true that for the average person the weight of the past would be too heavy a burden upon his consciousness, that he could not survive. Yet in nature it is not necessary that this entire itemized statement be forwarded. It is not necessary that we be confronted in each separate episode of perhaps a long and delinquent career. What is important to us is that out of the totals that are brought forward, out of the balance sheet of things, we shall come into some definite, basic comprehension of value, of reason, of purpose. That we shall sense our relationship to a living world rather than to an academic formula. Some way education must pick this up. Education must sometime make possible that the student shall understand through the conscious experience of bringing the, the faculties and powers which he has already created into focus and to use them to estimate the next thing that he must do. Until we get some of these principles more or less clarified in our thinking, we are going to live and die haphazardly without fully utilizing the energies and powers which we possess. It is hoped in Bacon's thinking, and certainly in his uh, concept of the Royal Society, this is clearly brought out. Uh, that gradually all knowledge, particularly among Western nations, will be brought closer and closer into harmony with one grand universal idealistic concept. That it will no longer be necessary for man to dichotomize between religious knowledge and material knowledge that man shall recognize one world, one universe in which he exists, that this universe is a continuous interplay of spiritual and material factors, that one is not essentially superior to the other, but that in this integration uh, the purpose of it all, the reason behind it all, is that man himself shall come to know all that it is necessary and possible for him to know. And to achieve this, he has got to change the foundations of his knowing. And one thing is very obvious, and we sense that today. In the 70 or 80 years in which we live here, there will be and are being made magnificent discoveries. Our own ways of life are such that most of these discoveries will elude us. We will never understand them while we are here. We will depart from this world in due course, and discovery will go on. We have very little understanding of the discoveries that have been made in the past. Our present pressure of life is so great that the progress of the moment is comparatively meaningless to us, and we will be gone when this progress produces in turn new fruit to carry forward our search for eternal knowledge. Therefore, if man must historically know all things, he would have to continuously exist here forever. If he is historically to know even what happens in the course of his lifetime, he must have energies, powers, freedoms, abilities, privileges, which the majority of human beings do not possess. Therefore, even if we are alive in an important generation, 
Only a small percentage of people will ever be able to truly benefit by this importance. The entire situation is such that our present way of approaching knowledge must end in futility, because it must end always in the passing away of an ignorant generation. Even if we have learned everything possible, in terms of the next generation we would still be ignorant. Even as the past, great as it was, uh, would be considered ignorant today in terms of many things that we know. So man never catches up with knowledge. Man never has been able to experience that kind of apperception which cuts through time and makes it possible for man to become immediately aware of the total value of existence. There has to be some way in which man can break through to reality. There has to be some way in which the individual can come into possession of that which he consciously, subconsciously, or unconsciously knows. The mystic has tried to solve this. He has solved it on the basis that he exists in a universe of eternal now, in which everything that ever has been, is, or will be, is in a state of suspended immediacy, and that by the proper extension or expansion of his own consciousness, he can attune himself to immediacy and to the experience that it contains. I think this is probably the mysterious school of the Holy Spirit, which was part of the Rosicrucian literature. And in this school it is said that every living thing is an ABC Darian, or taking his ABC lessons. We are all ABC students in the college of the Holy Spirit. This sort of implies, as Bacon does, that this whole universe is a very wonderful school, that this is the great university, that life itself, nature, the heavens, the earth, the seas, everything that exists is part of one tremendous educational pattern. Man's need is to become capable of adjusting his own consciousness to this pattern without falling into the net of minutia which causes him to be so fatally fascinated with some small detail that he loses sense of the entire magnitude of the project. This is why Bacon's emphasis is upon causes, upon causes and the secret motions of things, because our true knowledge is not to be gained in this endless questing of minutia, but in our sudden awareness of the essential purpose of the whole thing. It is certainly obvious that man, even had he the memory of a prodigious giant, had he the memory of God, would be taxed by the innumerable things that exist to be remembered. And in this generation, the amount of knowledge to be remembered is being doubled every 10 or 15 years. No faculty of man can contain all of this information. But this information is not essential knowledge. Because this information does not solve or complete the nature of man. The essential knowledge is that man shall become a completely enlightened creature. That man himself shall become self-sustaining in space. That he shall have conscious association with the larger universe around him, shall recognize his citizenship in space, and shall no longer be a lonely traveler shipwrecked on a desert island. That he shall no longer be this lost wanderer hunting for a utopia. For the whole world is in itself his college, his school. But he, in order to understand this and make it a vital fact, man must learn how to study.
He must learn what to study. <clears throat> he must recognize the difference between eternal truth and those facts which are interesting but not solutional. We have gone off again on the deep end of non-solutional fact. We can have all these facts and die miserably. We can continue to build these facts, pyramiding them upon one another, and still have another war with the most devastating consequences. These facts belong to certain luxuries of our thinking. They are perhaps ornamentations of our specializations, or even they may be avocations of our leisure hours. But the discovery of how to get to the moon is nothing more or less than an avocation of leisure hours. When we get all important things done, we can enjoy this if we wish to. If we ever get everything else important done, we probably would no longer wish to do this. But in any event, the development of great armaments, the expansion of great skills, these things are of the leisure of man, for they still do not prevent or remedy any of the principal emergencies of life. The great solution lies in the need of the direct thing, and the only answer to this need is that all attention should be devoted to the exploration of man's internal resources, so that from a full knowledge of man's own inner structure, we shall be able to build within him a foundation upon which his character can stand and upon which all other labors can be accomplished. And uh, the implication in the New Atlantis is that we will find in man under the spiritual dominion of consciousness itself, this great assembly of the learned, that the master of Solomon's house is consciousness itself, and that if we are able to find this consciousness, if we are able to find this core, we shall then come to essential knowledge. And having achieved this, and having protected our destinies and the destinies of our kinds from any emergency or catastrophe, we may then have our amusements. We may have our idols, be they of the marketplace or of the cave. We can explore any subject we wish because we have already established ourselves on a firm foundation. But if we attempt these diversified labors first and neglect this foundation, we shall not only suffer from lack of foundation, but will be unable to perfect these labors, because these labors, all of them, are dependent from a center of life consciousness. And until this consciousness is free to operate, no essential question that we ask can ever receive its complete answer. All answers come from within, from the same place that the question comes from. And until we answer the question inside, we will never be able to cure the ills of society on the outside. So when our emergency, when great trouble comes, and we ask divine guidance, we are actually asking the help of this mysterious college within ourselves, the college of the six days' work. And if we seek sincerely and earnestly after this labor, we shall certainly, in the quietude of our acceptances, receive that quality of knowledge which cannot be communicated from without, but which must arise in the sanctuary of our own hearts and souls, where only is sufficient understanding and insight available to us. So each one is encouraged to consider the importance of this great university, the university of the total past of the individual, available to him through the extension of consciousness inward rather than outward. And I think that more or less this is the larger story beneath and behind practically all of the great utopian works.
Well, I... cantonal republics of Switzerland. The Swiss had already come to a rather advanced sociological state, while much of Europe still languished in its own uh, despotisms. The Swiss cantonal system, with its tolerances, with its cooperative attitude toward life, uh, was of great interest to all practical thinkers of the time. And there is no doubt that the Switzerland served as an archetype for a number of the utopian productions. But this was not the full story. The full story was actually that man, looking about him for the first time, free from the oppression of the existing patterns, began to examine these patterns, find fault with them, observe how they could be changed, corrected, or improved and dared to state what he had discovered in some articulate way. He could no longer be burned at the stake for suggesting that something was wrong with his way of life. This newfound intellectual freedom produced a wave of rather progressive types of work, many of them extremely interesting. Of course, the classic of all the utopias is Moore's Utopia. And in this work, we find the beginning of a whole sequence of reflections upon existing evils. Reflections, however, that did not go sour, but rather took the challenge of the time and began to contemplate how the individual would live if he had something to say about the way he lived. Instead of being a victim of an oppressive feudalism, it was now his turn to do a little daydreaming. And these daydreams became quite interesting and articulate, and in many instances undoubtedly contributed to the rise of the Western democratic concept of living. I think we can say of Moore's Utopia that it suffered from the common ailments of these books, namely that it was rather stuffy. Uh, stuffy in the sense that if we read it today, we would not think it very progressive. We would feel that it was dogmatic, that it had about it too much of regimentation, that actually the individual uh, seeking a new freedom from one corruption fell under slavery to reform itself. So that instead of coming to liberty, he came to a classification, uh, which also is of some disturbance to people today wonder if a highly socialized system developing here would gradually destroy most of the individuality and freedom of expression of our modern way of life. Actually, of course, the authors of the utopias were not afflicting or burdening anybody. They created their characters, their cities, and their rules. And these rules never passed beyond the pages of their own books. But in spite of the restrictions and limitations of perspective that we might expect and must accept, we see that these people were working primarily uh, toward a, a concept of universal education, a concept of universal suffrage, a concept of e equality, of opportunity, of equity, and of the rights of man before the law and court of his time. Each in its own way was a proclamation of a Bill of Rights. Each author found, as he proceeded, that his city became ever more difficult to govern. Therefore, he had to continue to do what we have done, make new laws to maintain old ones, until his utopia was as law-ridden as many of the communities he sought to reform. This experience we all to use man's long journey as a way of introducing him into a new way of interpreting uh, the available information and correcting the fallacies of the existing condition. There was no dis decided or distinct break with the past. There was rather a reinterpretation of past events. We can sense this in all of the utopian uh, writings, for they have this one common a theme, namely, that regardless of how they sought to uh, create the concept of a better commonwealth, uh, 
they always traveled to some distant place by one experience or another, being lost at sea or shipwrecked or lost in deserts or whatever the case may be, they always came in the end to a fair place that had existed for a long time. Somewhere in the distant parts of the world was the ideal community. It had not been discovered because its location was remote and far from the ordinary courses of human trade and traffic. This ideal city, however, stood with its battlements, its walls, its moats, or whatever seemed to be the proper uh, equipment of the time. The principal difference was that it was a well-regulated city. It was Nuremberg or Heidelberg or London or any one of the cities of the time, but reformed, enlightened, the obvious weaknesses and corruptions of society corrected, and a better and more progressive attitude uh, reigned in this mysterious and distant city. Uh, the practical foundation for many of the utopias seems to have been the, re the development of the the New Atlantis of Lord Bacon. We have to place this type of thinking within some type of historical reference frame. We cannot estimate a work of the 17th century by the concepts of our own time. We must therefore consider it in the background of the conditions which produced it and the pressures uh, which brought it forth into objectivity. In the early years of the 17th century, an extraordinary phenomenon burst upon Europe. And that phenomenon was the Society of the Rosy Cross. This is probably one of the great mysteries of literature, and perhaps one of the great mysteries of history. This society issued a series of proclamations of which the Fama and Confessio Fraternitatis are the most famous. These manifestos announced a reformation of Europe, a universal reformation, in fact, a major change in the thought and life of mankind. That such works could come into existence meant that already what we call the Reformation had accomplished a large part of its labor. Man's mind was liberated from the tremendous orthodoxy that dominated the medieval world. At the same time, a series of rather brilliant intellectuals were experimenting on the fringe of what we call today philosophic humanism. Now, I'm well aware that the modern trends in humanism may be very materialistic, but such was not the original trend in the hands of these men, most of whom were devout and sincere, God-loving human beings. Humanism to them meant the beginning of the recognition of human dignity, that the individual was important. We are told that in the so-called medieval period, the individual simply did not exist. What we understand today by humanitarianism had no real equivalent in those times. The, each individual struggling for his own survival advanced his destiny regardless of cost to other individuals. Now, the tyranny of success was probably as severe then as it begins to appear that it is to be severe in the immediate future of our own time. Everything was sacrificed to a tremendous pressure for power. When humanism began to break through this barrier, 
Its primary interest was in the dignity of man himself. But this dignity was built upon classical foundations. The humanists derived their primary inspiration from Plato and Aristotle, and the great classical thinkers of uh, Southern Europe and North Africa. It had not occurred to these first humanists to break the ties with the past. What rather they hoped to accomplish was to bring about a restoration of the best of the past. 